Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today on Body Ecology Living with me, Donna Gates. Our show today is about autism, and this is Autism Awareness Month. So I've been working, I think everybody knows this about me, with autism for about 13 years now. I um, reached the point really where my heart mostly is in prevention of autism these days because once a child has autism, it's a difficult journey for the parents, for the child, and for the siblings. It's challenging to healthcare practitioners who are doing everything they can to help these children. So obviously, we really need to be thinking prevention. But what does a mother do? I mean, what is it like in the day of the life of someone with autism? What is their journey like as they, you know, do everything they can to recover this beloved child uh, that, you know, they move mountains for? What What is it like? You know, what's the struggle like for them? So I had a great idea, I thought, to invite Susan Levin. She has been somebody I've been talking to off and on for years, really, as her son Ben, uh, ben had autism, but she's been working with her husband and, and Ben's sister, everybody really working together to help Ben recover. So it's been quite a journey for her, and she's a perfect person to talk to about autism and give you an insight into autism. But she has a new book out called Unlocked, A Family Emerging from the Shadows of Autism. Now, you might be at this point thinking, why would I listen to a talk on autism? I don't have autism. I've got all these other problems like chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. I have candidiasis. I have um, lots of toxins and heavy metals in my body. I'm not a good detoxifier and on and on and on. So why would I think it would be valuable to talk to you about autism? Well, because autistic children with autism have all of that. They have everything wrong with them, but they've also been damaged uh, because of, you know, in my opinion, for sure, definitely uh, from vaccines. And there's a whole lot of people that feel that way. If you go to a doctor whose child has autism, and many of them uh, that are in the field of helping children with autism, they do have children, their own children have autism. So ask them if they would vaccinate their child, and they will tell you without any doubt, absolutely not. So I think that says a lot right there without even bringing up the whole issue of, of vaccines. But what do you do when you find out that your child really has autism and, you know, can they get well? Can they recover? Well, they are recovering all the time. It's difficult. And so I'm going to bring on my guest today, Susan Levin, and we're going to start talking about, about, you know, this whole recovery process. And I can promise you, you'll find something in it for you, something that you can use to help in your recovery, even if you don't have autism. So just to tell you about Susan, she's the uh, first and foremost, she's a wife and a mother. She happens to be a Harvard graduate, an inspiring motivational speaker. She's now an author, but she was a former family law attorney and a family wellness coach. Today, she does trainings in both integrative and bio-individual nutrition. So you can see this is a perfect example of what our mothers, what is a mother of an autistic child like? Well, they're usually highly intelligent very motivated, successful in everything they've ever done in their whole life. In Susan's case, she was a Harvard graduate. And so obviously this is who, you know, we're we're talking to is mothers like this who are highly motivated and now turn their attention to get their children well. So Susan, are you there? I am. (laughs) That was kind of a long introduction, but I really want people to understand that autism isn't sitting over here by itself in its own category, and that has nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. Autism affects every single one of us. And uh, I I was just thinking this morning, because I've been, um, soon I'm going to be going up to a preconception conference. Uh, Dr. David Berger and some of his colleagues have formed a group of, for doctors to start to learn about, you know, what to do to help parents uh, conceive a child so they don't have autism or anything else. And this is, you know, very long overdue. And I really believe that autism has driven this a new attention toward preconception because Dr. David Berger has been working with autistic families for a very long time, and he saw the need for this. So um, you, however, I remember you telling me that your own pregnancy was a little 
challenge. I mean, can you kind of give us an idea of what life was like when you were pregnant with Ben and some of the early signs of uh, early life with him that sort of began to be clues that he had autism? Yeah, sure. So um, my pregnancy was eventful. Um, I won't go into a lot of the medical details, but it was very stressful. I have been a very healthy eater for a long time, but one of the things that I really have learned over the past, you know, seven to 10 years of working with Ben um, and doing things with diet and cleansing and a lot of organic healing modalities is how sick my body was and how relevant that was. And I think it's so wonderful, um, just the idea of a preconception conference to educate families before they become families so they can avoid, you know, uh, what, what we've had to go through is absolutely wonderful um, well, what would you have done you know, differently looking back now? Well, a lot of things that I learned, you know, um, about food, um, specifically food. You know, I, I ate, I didn't eat junk food, but I ate a, a lot of foods that I know now were contributing to, um, you know, yeast overgrowth. I didn't know anything about fermented uh, vegetables and the probiotics, con- you know, that they, that they offer and, um, you know, just uh, so many things, eating the same things all the time um, and just not really nourishing myself in a way that was really balanced. Um, A lot of things with the environment, you know, I I would have done a lot of things differently in my home. Um, A lot of the medicines, I I basically lived on Advil. I had chronic pain for five or six years, um, way before my son, uh, before I was pregnant with my son. And um, I I would definitely not take, you know, ibuprofen three times a day, every day for four years. You know, that just wasn't helpful. (laughs) Well, well, let me um, just add something to that, too, because if you get to a doctor who's trained in functional medicine these days, they will always look for the root cause. So why would you, if you came to them and you said, well, I, I have to take this pain medication every day, they'd say, let's see why. And they would check all kinds of things, including your hormones, your thyroid, adrenal function. Are you sleeping well? How are you eating? Eating first and foremost. And um, then, and, and that wasn't something years ago when Ben was born, that was not something doctors knew to do, to go to the root cause. Right, which is such a shame because um, I, we really believe that Ben's autism um, came from many different sources. And, 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 you know, one of the main ones definitely being a mom whose um, gut was overrun with yeast. I mean, I had yeast infections. It, it is really clear to me. Um, some of the signs that we saw with Ben were, you know, Ben – was a very happy child. Uh, as an infant, I always say he was in his own perfect little heaven. We just weren't invited in. So he didn't oh, look at that. me. He didn't hug us. If I hugged him, he was limp in my arms. Um, we had no eye contact. The only time Ben looked at us was if there were a camera in between us and something about that made it less intense for him. So we have all this video of Ben looking right at the camera. He doesn't look so autistic, but the truth is if the camera weren't there, he would never look at us. We had a lot of low muscle tone. Ben drooled um, until he was five. He actually had to wear a bib until he was five because the drooling was so constant. And But the main thing was a total lack of interest in other human beings and interrelating with them. Like I said, he seemed really happy. He smiled a lot. He giggled. And um, also he was really a picky eater. He lived on things that I know today were just basically gluten and casein. And so he loved mac and cheese. He downed lots of milk. Um, you know, things that once we removed those, an entire layer of fog lifted off, you know, so. Um, and why is that? Was, because uh, the recommended diet today is a gluten-free, uh, casein-free, and really sugar-free diet because, you know, in the early days, um, well, actually, when I joined the autism community, there literally people were beginning to whisper that, you know, maybe gluten-free, casein-free is good, but right. they had tons of sugar in the food because, you know, kids like sugar. They like donuts and cupcakes and pancakes and 
I knew they couldn't get well because they seemed to have, they, I just had learned that they have yeast infections. And I since then now know every child, practically every child today is born with a yeast infection. We need to know that and start off, you know, getting that inner ecosystem in place and building that immune system and, you know, uh, changing that immediately in a child's life. And we do that, but n- no one understood that that many years ago. And how old has Ben? So Ben is 12 now. And it's so funny what you say, Donna. I used to tell my husband all the time when Ben was a, a really little baby, oh, he smells like bread baking. It smells so wonderful. <laughs> now oh, I know I was yeah. probably smelling the yeast. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, yeah, definitely all all the gut issues, you know, um, he was definitely fogged out with yeast and, and, you know, he definitely had leaky gut and, um, he wasn't getting his nutrients and he was drawn, you know, to these foods that were feeding the yeast. And so, you know, more and more and more he wanted them and he had no interest in foods that didn't feed the yeast. And so that made it really, um, you know, for me as a mom, I wanted him to eat. So I just Mm -hmm. gave him all the wrong foods. You know, you don't Mm -hmm. know what you don't know. Now though, um, besides yeast being an issue, what else is going on? I I would put very, at the very top of the list is they're not good detoxifiers. And amazingly, most of the children are actually born with gut dysbiosis. I mean, it's everyone I've ever worked with. Yeah. So there's, there's definitely the yeast. Um, For us, there was a whole lot of food intolerances. I mean, we started with gluten-free and casein-free. We very quickly took away soy. Um, We certainly took away sugar, uh, dyes. Um, Then we got to where we were removing grains and uh, we we went pretty radical. Um, And it was, you know, one of the things that's so hard about parenting a child on the autism spectrum is this feeling of utter isolation. And, um, you know, I felt when Ben, when Ben was undiagnosed, I felt like a, my kid was a Martian. Like I, I had never had a baby before. I didn't know what to make of this child who didn't interact with us at all. And I was very ashamed. Then when Ben got a diagnosis, and that was when he was just almost five, um, I really didn't feel much relief, to be honest with you. I felt like he had a label now, but I still felt like the whole thing was my fault. And and it wasn't rational. I didn't know about my own gut dysbiosis or anything as logical as that. It was just, as a mom, for whatever reason, I felt like if there's something wrong with my kid on some level, it must be my fault. And so, um, you know, the isolation was a huge thing. And then we started doing these interventions you know, putting him on healing diets and um, doing cleansing and things that were really out of the box. And people judged us. And we actually had family members disconnect from us. And uh, that that was really, really hard. But, you know, um, we saw changes in Bandana. So, you know, that kept motivating us. And then what happened was, you know, we found out that there were other families going through this. And, you know, honestly, a lot through social media, I, I you know, found Facebook groups and um, people in my community that were going through this and, and taking these same sort of risks, introducing these same sort of what at the time was very radical interventions, you know, and um, and talking about how it felt to have a kid who really didn't acknowledge that you were in the room ever was, was very therapeutic. And, um, it's one of the reasons I wrote the book, um, because I, I wanted to say to families, like, you're not alone. It's not your fault. There's a lot of parents going through this and and there's a lot of hope. And, um, it's been very gratifying to have people respond, you know, and say, thank you, because you do feel, you feel really very alone and it's kind of the last thing that you had envisioned when you, when you go to have a baby, you have this vision of starting a family, having grandparents and, um, you know, expanding your life in this beautiful way. And instead with autism is our life contracted so that the grandparents would come and we felt terribly embarrassed because our kid wouldn't talk to them wouldn't even acknowledge them, you know, and, and they didn't understand. And so they would get angry, which is totally understandable. And, um, 
And then our social life contracted. We couldn't take Ben anywhere. We couldn't go anywhere. He would have explosions. And um, so that's been really important for us is, is as a family, we reached out and we tried to create some community within the autism community. And, and that, that was really helpful. Finding support as a family, I think, is really critical because the, the interventions are not easy. You know, taking away foods that your kid loves and, and uh, introducing other foods. I mean, we've learned methods to introduce those foods and that's been great, but it is not an easy journey. It's worth it. It's worth it, but it's it's not easy. Well, I think every parent, whether they have a child with autism or not, ha- struggles with that. You know, finding ways to introduce healthy foods, get the kids off of the junk foods that they're drawn to. Yes. Uh, can you give people a few tips on that? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that we learned to do was rather than take away the bad foods all at once and leave them with these sort of like substitute things that didn't look like anything they wanted to eat, was to introduce healthy foods while they still had the other foods. And um, so I might make, you know, um, a bread. There's there's a bread that I do. It's a buckwheat bread. And, um, you know, there, there are things called oxalates and they can be problematic for kids on the spectrum. So we kind of you know, it seems like every food that you look to, you have to be careful of all the different issues. But anyway, so we, we, um, I learned how to make this bread. It was very easy. And I started putting that in before taking the other things out, um, the regular bread. And right, I was, they're still, you know, they're used to eating bread or that's cup, right, cupcakes that's or right. something bread. That's right. And so and you, so you yeah. want to first step is to substitute a healthier choice. And yes, buckwheat has oxalate. And yes, there's a huge connection that we now know. No, we didn't know this once, but now we know that there's a connection between oxalate and candidiasis. But, um, you know, you can't do everything at once. That's the step-by-step principle. So do, you know, start by making these healthier choices. And then later on, to me too, the adding of the fermented foods is so critical. If, If at that meal, you also have a few scoops of, say, fermented vegetables or you're drinking some of our probiotic liquid or coconut kefir, then that you're putting bacteria into that meal as it travels through your body. And those bacteria will eat oxalates. That's what they do. And for people that don't know, oxalate is a a substance, a molecule in plants that is um, especially high in spinach, chocolate, soy, sweet potatoes, um, nuts and seeds. Grains and grains, Uh, a lot of grains, right? um, well, the grain-like seeds that we recommend, quinoa, buckwheat, and amaranth, they are our seeds, really. So they are high in oxalate. You can prepare foods mm-hmm. to remove the oxalates or at least greatly reduce them. And so now I recommend that people put a pot of boiling water on the stove and then pour their soaked millet or quinoa into the water, let it bubble around and boil for 11 to 15 minutes, and then pour off that water. And when you do, and catch the quinoa in the strainer, but when you do... You pour all that, a whole bunch of the oxalates have left and gone down the drain in the water. So there's ways to get around that. Um, but then the food, you, you, so what were some of the grains that you eliminated though? Yeah. So we, we took out, well, um, at first we were doing a diet where there were no grains. And so we actually took out all the grains initially. And that actually didn't work so well for Ben. All these diets, you know, one of the really complicated things, and honestly, one of the reasons I love, body ecology. And one of the reasons I asked Donna to write the afterword to my book is that it's really livable and really balanced. So when we took out all the grains, my son became extremely lethargic. And, you know, some of the diets I think are good maybe for a short period of time, but the ones, you know, the one that we landed on was, was body ecology with the seed like grain and with the grain like seeds. And, um, and, Right. Like learning from Donna, how to prepare them. The other thing was, um, definitely, um, using what's available. And and originally, you know, I felt that I had to make every single thing at home. And what I found was you can get great fermented vegetables, like at your neighborhood co-op, you know, you just have to make sure they're lacto fermented and to kind of make it a little more livable because, making every single thing yourself is, is a lot. And, um, and we found things, you know, my, my son loves lacto fermented pickles and sauerkraut. He hates ginger carrots, (laughs) you know, so, 
Um, we know we we did a lot of trial and error, and and the step by step is so great because you know being willing to trust that even if right now it doesn't seem like it's working, and even if right now my son was rejecting everything, to just keep bringing it and just keep trying. We also found out the relationship between zinc and like. T- things tasting good. And we found out my son had a zinc deficiency. And so when that was corrected and that happened a lot through body ecology, actually, he started eating tons of different kinds of foods that he hadn't been willing to eat when his, his zinc was low. And, um, so let's see um, an example of what I said in the beginning, people are going to listen to this and learn a lot of little tricks here. That's what's so beautiful about autism. I know it's awful in many ways, but there, um, you, we also have learned so much about the body, how it works, the brain, the gut-brain connection through autism coming into the world. You know, just like yes. years ago, AIDS came in and everybody started for the first time really looking at the immune system. We didn't know much about it then. And autism has been the same way. So it's been awful, but it's been a blessing to the world in many ways. I really agree. And I, I also think that it's been a blessing uh, to me, um, not just, I mean, there's a whole, you know, emotional, psychological aspect, but just on a purely healing my own body, I would never have discovered um, what I did about healing. I lived with chronic pain. I lived with chronic fatigue. Um, I had a lot of mood swings and emotional ups and downs. I had bloating and I had this kind of, uh, what do they call it? The muffin top that I carried around. And you know, when I was learning about all these things with my my son, um, and I also have a daughter, and she has gut issues because um, it's you know all in the family. Um, we all went on this, and that's another you know tip that I would say is let the whole family do the healthier eating because it's very hard, I think, for a child to feel like he has to eat a certain way, and the other people in the family don't. So we all started eating these better foods. And and I have to say, I really never ate anything that wasn't wrapped in cellophane up until a certain point in my life. I was not a cook. Um, I uh, It was really trial by fire for me. So, you know, I say that because I think there's a lot of mothers, and as Donna said, a lot of children with autism have parents who are really, you know, um, professionals who are not used to doing a lot of cooking, a lot of stuff around the home. And um, I had to really accept that that was part of this deal. For Ben to recover, I had to take the time as if I was in like a PhD program and um, and go and learn how to do these things. And I, I don't think I did it particularly well, but my heart was really in it. And so I did learn. And now I know how to cook things that are really tastes good. Um, but you know, it's, it's definitely really important that the family make a commitment to doing it. And, you know, my daughter eats things at birthday parties that we don't have in our home. Um, and as Ben has gotten healthier, Ben has also been able to eat a wider diet than he was, you know, the first five or six years even. So, Mm -hmm. so that improved, but, um, you know, the whole entire, process, as you said, is like getting a PhD. I have said in conferences where mothers, I look around the room and there's a doctor up there, you know, with his PowerPoint, explaining some extremely complicated scientific something about the body. And they're sitting there taking notes and learning. It's like an in, like instantly jumping into a PhD program. You're right. The whole emotional part of it is is amazing too. I mean, I think it makes people mature quickly and become very focused on someone other than themselves. But let's talk about that whole part of it. Because last year when I was speaking at Autism One, one of my talk was about, you know, what we're still missing in helping these kids recover. And one of the things I brought up is the elephant in the room. Now, a lot of times I'm way ahead of the game and nobody's listening to me for a while, for a few more years, but really feel strongly about this. But um, the elephant in the room is that we all know that the kids are getting special attention and they know they're getting lots of attention and this is how mom and dad show their love to me. And my sister and my brother are not 
as important as I am because I have autism. And so um, that's a strong, deep, ingrained message. And I believe that until we address the whole emotional component, there should be a whole entire track on this where we deal with the whole entire emotional component for the parents, for the child, for the siblings. Um, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, that, you know, that is absolutely critical. One of the really big gifts I received during uh, this journey, this autism recovery journey that I've been on was actually during a uh, consultation with you, Donna. You made the suggestion to me that I not talk about autism in relation to Ben anymore. And, um, or if I did, it was that you used to have autism, you know, and um, that was very powerful because there's something about identifying a child with a problem that isn't so good. And um, I I think it's been great. Ben has really um, taken that on now that he really used to have autism and he doesn't. And now he wants to help other kids. And um, I I think that that was really pivotal. My daughter, um, we have a a little uh, trailer for the book tour on YouTube right now um, called Unlock the Hope Movie. And my daughter is in it and she's Ben's younger sister, Alina. And she talks about feeling neglected. And that she spoke to me about it and <laughs> things got a little bit better, but not completely. And, and I know that's true because um, it is. And then as a mom, you feel really pulled apart. I, I remember one day when uh, I was sort of going between the children, they both wanted me. And this is not just special needs families, of course. This is any mom dealing with two kids. But when there are special needs involved, you really feel confused as a mom. I did anyway. And I remember my son just yelling out, just clone yourself, mom, you know, and me thinking, I really wish I could because I need a mom for Alina and I need a mom for Ben. And then I need a a wife for my husband, you know, because that. And he needs someone for you, for you. For (laughs) me, absolutely. And boy, does that take the bottom rung. Well, you know, I remember you saying one time that, um, so, okay, so. At some point, a parent really, first, I think when a parent gets a diagnosis, is a part of them in shock and disbelief and hoping the diagnosis is wrong and the child's going to pull out of it. And I think a lot of doctors even keep watching the child in the first you know, year or two thinking, well, they're just going to outgrow this. And, and probably some do. If it's very mild, um, and the parents know to adjust the diet and so on, but um but but the ones who truly are, I mean, you find, it finally sinks in that my child has autism. Um, the, you know, I'd like to walk people through the process, like acceptance and then, um, or not acceptance and, you know, fighting it, fighting it. And, you know, yeah. you said to me once that you, um, that you let go of how you wanted Ben to be. And then when you did that, you discovered your son. What did you mean by that? Well... When I thought about having children, I had a certain vision in mind. And, um, you know, a big part of that vision was that this child was going to be a little bit of a mini me, you know, a combination of my husband and me and, and that he would have all these wonderful qualities. And I grew up with a really wonderful relationship with my parents. And I envisioned that Connection. I had pictures in my mind of what our family would look like. And, and you I had, had so much to give a child. You know, you and your husband are highly educated. Uh, you weren't right. financially struggling. Um, right. And a lot of love. You're in the perfect place, as many parents are. And then the love is there, and they're just going to give yeah. this child everything. Exactly. And, and then along comes this child who has no interest in connecting with me at all. And literally doesn't seem to know I'm in the room almost all the time. And so the the feelings of disappointment, confusion, as I said, self-blame, what's wrong with me, this must be my fault, um, were terrible. And there there is a grieving. There's an absolute grieving of that vision. And I really had to ask myself, what mattered more, Ben being the child I wanted him to be or me learning to love 
this child as he actually, as who he actually is. And I, that took me years. I was pissed. I was really angry. And, um, but I got a lot of help. There's a wonderful program called the Sunrise Program, S-O-N, that was created by two parents whose child was profoundly autistic and they, they recovered him um, through a lot of stuff with diet and also a home-based child-centered program that we used with Ben and that brought him, you know, really uh, in conjunction with the, the diet and the healing, other uh, organic healing modalities brought him out of autism. And... Um, you know, they, one of the things about the Sunrise program is that they give the parents a lot of support and coaching. And we really needed that because we were really stuck. We were hopeless. We were depressed. We were confused. As I said, we were grieving this vision of the life and the family we thought we would have. And we, my husband and I both worked through a lot of that. And over the years, and it also helped that as we did these interventions, Ben did get better. And we found out who Ben was because we started really paying attention to what he was saying. We stopped trying to make him be who he wanted him to be, learn the things we wanted him to learn. And we started letting him really do what he wanted to do and watching him and paying attention. And wow, he turns out he's this amazing kid with all these interests. And, um, and I did. I found out who he was. And now it's flipped. And now Ben is interested in us. And Ben wants to teach us things. And, you know, he tells us things. But I got to tell you, it's still to me, if I say to Ben after school, you know, picking him up in my van, hey, Ben, how was school? He'll say, hi, mom. It was great. It, it, it's like amazing. <laughs> I, it, I don't take any of it for granted, but I, I definitely needed to let go of trying to make him something mm-hmm. that I wanted him mm-hmm. to be. And, and do you hard. think, do you think that had he not been born with, with autism, would he be different than he is today? Do you think, in other words, do you think autism made him a better person? I can't separate Ben from his autism. Um, I, one of the things I learned was that autism was part of who Ben is. It's like um, to love someone unconditionally means loving all of who they are. I, I didn't have to like all of it. You know, I certainly didn't like tantrums and disconnection and obsessive behaviors and rigidity and all that kind of thing that we had when Ben had autism. But um, I, I had to stop fighting that part of him. And um, Ben is Ben. <laughs> ben had autism. Ben now has, we always say, and it's, it's true though, um, you know, Ben has moved from autism to ADD and we're psyched, you know, what we really are. Um, and, and I really believe that as we continue to work with Ben's diet and healing, that he'll recover from that too. Cause I think that's probably just more, you know, leaky gut and yeast and all this other stuff that we're looking at. Um, but I, I wouldn't want Ben any other Ben, um, any more than I would want my daughter, any other Alina. And my daughter has a lot of her own issues too. And she never had autism, but Ben is who he is. And and once I got that, Donna, it got easier. Once I stopped wanting him to be someone who didn't have autism, you know, I, I didn't want Ben to be, I wanted Ben to have all the choices in life. You know, I still do. Um, Ben tells us all the time he wants to have a wife and kids and he's a writer. He's written like 25 children's books now and they're really actually quite good. And, you know, he wants to be a writer when he grows up. And um, I want all that for him. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he'll have it, too. Um, One of the things I think is so important is to is the power of a mother to paint a picture, a vision for her child of what they're going to be. You will hear many, many successful people um, if they came from really poor ghetto like conditions, give credit to their mother for believing in them and wanting more for them. That's how they got out. So something I'm I'm sure this is one of the things I I mentioned when we were talking, Susan, in in our uh, consults, was that um, women don't realize the power of 
their vibration, their voice. Um, the baby grows from the very beginning of life, basically from a seed or an egg that develops and develops inside of us. So every single thing we're feeling, if we're stressed out, if we're happy and joyful, if we're sad, the baby's that too. And reacting to that, reacting to that emotion that we're feeling, uh, what we're eating. Uh, I just saw something just the other, uh, like literally, I think it was last night on the news about how they found out um, they're, sh they're showing a baby in the womb. So you can actually see the babies in there. And when the mother's smoking, the baby's covering his mouth and his eyes wow. and trying to protect himself from the wow. smoke. So yes, babies are in there already forming opinions. So when I studied child development back in college, because uh, that was my, my first degree was um, in child, uh, child development. So, you know, th honestly, they knew nothing compared to mm -hmm. what they know today. And mm -hmm. I was always digging for information and trying to find it, but it just wasn't there. And people thought that the baby started developing sometime after birth. Well, that was because babies, you know, the baby boomer babies, they were all drugged. Their mothers were put to sleep. And when the mom wo woke up, she was informed that she had a healthy baby boy or a girl. And it took days for all that anesthesia, the drugs they'd given the mother to put her to sleep to wear off the baby. So they didn't seem particularly alert compared to today's yeah. babies who are looking around, look, looking for their mom, trying to find her, you know, because that eye to eye contact immediately after birth is really critical. Now, I know that the beginning of your life with, with Ben was exciting. I mean, he was born <laughs> on the way to the hospital, right? No, no, no. We didn't even get that far. Ben was oh. born by accident in a walk-in closet in our home oh. in Lexington <laughs> and I was alone. And um, so, yeah, there was, I mean, I, I think it's such a wonderful point you bring up, Donna, because this sense of mothers taking care of themselves. And, you know, I used to take everything I heard about how a mom had an impact on the fetus as another, uh, you know, reason to beat myself up because look, if I didn't smile enough, look, I was tense. Look, I didn't eat right. Look, I didn't go out enough. But now what I know is that it's so empowering as a mother to know how much I can give my child, you know, that, that if I am taking care of myself and, you know, I, as, a, as a coach for families now, um, one of the things that I really focus on with parents is taking care of themselves and um, so that they have so much more to offer their children and, you know, um, the, I completely believe that the connection between a mother and her children starts in the womb and goes on forever. forever. I, mean, I really see Absolutely. that. Absolutely. You know, you, a, a uh, lot of parents can see that. Let's say you're in a bad mood for some reason. You had an argument with your your partner or your husband. He's gone off to work and you're kind of disturbed about that. And you've got two children over in the family room fighting with each other and, yes. you know, being mean and not. And yes. then you change, something happens and, you know, your husband calls and he says, um, I'm so sorry. And then you make up and then the kids are perfectly fine. They're picking up that vibration all the time. So you can use that in a very powerful way as you did by saying to Ben, you're getting well. Okay, now you're well. That's a hist right. That's history. And then the the power of a mother painting those pictures, changing the belief system of their that child is enormous, and it's a power we never use as women. And fathers have it too. I don't want to just, yeah. but mothers especially yeah. because of that incredible intimate connection that we do have from the beginning. So even, you know. You know, even with an adult child or a teenager, what you say, I know my, my 24, my last child I didn't have till I was 44, so he's only he's like 24 now. So, but he said to me once, your voice is always in my head. Like he was angry, you know, like, I wish I could get rid of you <laughs> and your voice in my head. Because um, uh, even though he didn't do what I said by the time he was a teenager, it was, he knew what I wanted, <laughs> he should be doing uh, that I would want him to do. And um, I know it's definitely shaped him. One of the good things I wanted to point out, though, to you, Susan, is that Ben's about to go into his teenage years. And that is a, another really powerful time of change, growth, development, brain change, bone density, uh, probably the most important time of all for increasing bone density. So I'm always really excited when a, a child can reach the stage at, uh, in such good shape like Ben is, knowing that now his hormones are going to work for him, where other children who do reach the stage and they haven't been getting well, 
the hormones are now going to work against them and actually kind of lock some of that into place so it gets harder and harder to recover mm-hmm. that child. Mm-hmm. But this is a really good period that you're going into. That's and um, yeah. and I love it yeah. what you said about Ben seeing himself. I've said this to many parents. See your child, your son, let's say, or daughter, standing at an altar, getting married with this glowing feeling on their face and you're sitting there remembering that many years ago you had this issue to deal with you know and that that is what i i've you know my kids haven't gotten much like ben's not that old yet but we don't know if we're gonna you're gonna see that but i'm sure you will and i think that power that you know and that's what you're teaching in your family wellness coaching i think it's a beautiful aspect that you bring into what you're doing and what you wrote in the book unlocked so let's talk about the book a little bit So, um, the book really, uh, started out as a blog that I wrote for four years and it was an amazing experience to write it because I, I wrote it therapeutically. I, I, I wrote it because I needed to write because there was so much intense emotion inside of me every single day going through this. And so I wrote, um, a blog because when you're blogging, you have this sense of being seen. And I really felt, as I said, so alone. And then what happened was uh, people started making comments and things and following me and, um, and I started interacting and it was really wonderful. And uh, I spoke at a parenting symposium at my college 25th reunion. And um, some people came over and said, you should write a book. And I thought, ah, that's silly. Um, But you know, what happened was I, I really wanted to once Ben seemed to really have taken um, a turn for the better uh, and and was in school and thriving, I really felt that I wanted to share with other families what we had experienced and help them on all levels. Um, I I got certified as an integrated nutritionist and and studying bio individual nutrition and um, and and certainly the emotional the feelings of overwhelm and, you know, wanting to help families navigate the many, many interventions available and just someone to be there. So I, I thought, well, I'll just do a little self-published book to let them know who I am kind of as a business card. And what happened was a friend of mine who's a writer took my stuff and sent it to her publisher. And one day I got an email, you know, by the way, uh, that saying, you know, Susan, your, your book proposals come across my desk and my publisher, Tony Lyons, would like to publish it. And it's this wonderful, wonderful publishing house in New York City, Skyhorse Press, that's really devoted a lot to uh, autism publication. Um, so that's the book. And and so I took the blogs, which is basically our experience, um, kind of our odyssey for the past four years at that time, and, um, and, and turned it into a book. And uh, we have about 24, 25 book events around the country over the next few months where I'll be speaking and showing the movie and doing a QA. and a And what's wonderful is that when, when you start talking to people about autism and they think, you know, as you said, Donna, oh, that doesn't really relate to me. There's always a moment of, oh, wait, but I know them and they know someone and they, you know, autism you know, there's a new statistic out, I'm sure you know, as Stephanie Seneff, that by the year 20, about 2032, 50% of our children will be on the spectrum and Ooh. 80% of those will be boys. The card I was so. given when I checked into the autism uh, you know, speaker's table last year was um, by 2015. Yeah, 50%. I spoke actually with true? Stephanie. Well, I spoke with Stephanie and she said that she's she's recently changed that. But still, oh, that's okay. like, we're just talking 17 years, Donna. I mean, that's yeah, like, exactly. that's right around the corner. So it's relevant for oh, it's everyone. It's just one more generation. Yeah, and exactly. And we are going to be, and, exactly. and so you might think, um, well, my child's safe. He doesn't have autism, but what kind of world is your child going to live with when that's every it. other person is going to be... Um, and what about their children? Different, yeah. yeah. And, and will their children be safe? Yeah, no, right. it's we have no more time. We are out of time. And um, yeah, are you coming right. to the autism one? Um, I am, I am. With me, because I'll be, we'll, we'll both be there then. People can yeah. meet us and talk to us and you can sign yep. your book and I'll be there too with a new cookbook. <laughs> and, oh, and you've great. got recipes too that they can access too, right? Yeah, yeah. if people go to my website, which is uh, roadstofamilywellness.com, if you sign up for the email newsletter, then we send you out um, 
the first of my ebook series, which is called The Unexpected Donut, Healthy Treats Your Family Will Actually Want to Eat. And it's um, basically body ecology recipes um, that I've innovated for desserts. And, and there's going to be a series of different meals. There's the unexpected uh uh, eggnog, which is holiday treats, the unexpected French fry, which is um, snacks and, and so forth. So, do you um, use um, yeah. what do you use for sweeteners? We use Lakanto primarily. We use stevia a little bit, but we mostly use Lakanto. And there, um, and then I'm very proud because I'm sort of considered the godmother of Lakanto because I brought I it know. into the country I know. We and love made it. people aware of it. So, and then and stevia nobody too. knows about it. Nobody knows not about Lakanto. Not yeah. enough people. Not enough people. So, um, and because you see stevia, which I had first brought in and worked with, you know, and first it was a powder, so it was really not stevia. It was robotius. It was a little stevia in it, but it did, you couldn't bake with it. So when I found Lakanto over in Japan for 15 years, now the Japanese have used it. Um, it's so safe and it's zero calories and it, you can bake with it, which is really great. Now they have a golden one and a white one and uh, you can go to their website too. And I'm sure that they would love to uh, put your book up there. Uh, the recipes are link over to you, Susan. So oh, we yeah. need to talk to them yeah. about that because they, you're right. People just don't know what a great sweetener it is, uh, non-sweetener sweetener. That's right. And that you can make foods that are not only safe for your children, but actually look and taste normal because, you know, yes. kids don't want to eat weird looking food. Nor do we. Really don't. Really. And the yeah. healthier people get, the really, the more, the more they, they do want to branch out and have tastier foods. Um, you know, and I have also used Lakanto, for example, in recipes like a teriyaki sauce that you might want to put on top right. of chicken or oh, fish. See, we don't have to just use it for baking, by the way. It's got savory purposes too. Yeah. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that and uh, mentioned Lakanto and, and just so people know that there are choices. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. I, I think um, I'm very grateful to you too, Susan, I want to say for you grasping the value of body ecology, using it to help Ben recover, sharing it with other people, putting it in the book uh, because there just isn't enough. Um, I, I'm always thinking that with the number of kids we've recovered, you would think people would be lined up at the door to uh, do, you know, do, to yeah. use body ecology with their families, but they're they're not. And it's and then I still talk to families, and they don't know anything at all. I mean, you know, they've never even heard of it. So there's such an enormous job yet to do to wake. Well, I think up. some of the healing diets that are out there right now are really extreme. And again, I think for a short term, they were helpful for my son. But I think as a long term way of eating, they really were, well, first of all, they were acidifying because there was lots and lots of meat. They were yeast causing because there was lots and lots of honey and um, really high on the oxalates with with almond flour. And so for us, um, body ecology you know, as I said, it's really livable and it tastes good. And the thing, one of the most amazing things to me is, is watching my kids' palates open up as they, as their guts got healthier and their bodies started to take in more minerals, that foods that were less extreme and not yeast causing became really delicious to them. Because I, I tried with a lot of healing diets. I wanted to be that mom who says, my kid never ate anything and now he eats everything. And it never happened. Mm -hmm. And then for us, and, and again, I, I can only speak for our family, but that is what happened finally after literally nine, like, I guess it was five years on those other diets. I shifted over to body ecology because we were just stuck. And um, my son started eating greens and fish and kelp noodles. And I mean, if I can tell you, my son would not touch, he wouldn't probably even be willing to look at these things. So I, you know, for us, it, it's been really just balancing and we all eat that way and we all eat it. It's a very delicious and livable diet. And it's, uh, you know, all this stuff is so hard, but I just want to say to families, you know, there's just so much hope. I and mean, we were so colossally hopeless, really despondent and wondering about our lives, our daughter's life. You know, we felt that autism was a curse and that we were burdened. And, um, you know, today it's seven years post-diagnosis. And as I said, you know, Ben's not out of the woods. He has profound ADD. He lost, he missed a lot of social 
milestones and, you know, he's still catching up, but, um, but he's really here now. And there is just, and I'm not anything wonderful. I did research and I'm a hard worker, but mostly what I did was just kind of suit up, show up and, you know, like do the best I could. And it turns out that that was enough. Um, Mm -hmm. and I just, I want that message to be out there for moms. You don't have to do this perfectly. If you're not smiling all the time, I I do still yell at my kids. (laughs) I'm not always sending out those positive vibrations, you know, that's good because that's normal. That's what we all do. (laughs) That's what we want. Exactly. And it's, it's really doable. And, you know, I think, uh, it's important to point out too, that isn't just for autism. There's so many other conditions children have today. Mm. Mm-hmm. From ADD to out food allergies, um, gut dysbiosis, sleeping problems, um, you know, they're just uh, depressed. I see a lot of children unhappy, depressed, dark circles under their eyes and so on. So this information isn't really just for autism. It's for every parent who has a child or wants to have a child, you know, because I think part of preparing yourself for a child... Um, one of the things I, I do work with lots of women now that are pregnant or about to get pregnant and they, they, they call us, they come to us because they know that they want to prevent it and it can be prevented. So that's again, a really important message. So you have um, emerged as a success story and we need many, many more of those. And, and your book is like a journal that, that has people, um, kind of takes people through the process uh, of, of, of recovery for you and for Ben. And um, they'll, they'll have their own uh, stories. I, I think the journaling idea is beautiful. Uh, do you think you'll ever show um, your journal to Ben someday? Oh, Ben's seen it. Yeah, Ben has actually been really involved with the book writing. And um, there are certain things I said, like, you know, are you comfortable me having this in? And he said, no, Uh, (laughs) you know, and I took them out. And Uh, um, but he's he's really he 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 comes to as many of the events as he can. He's we have an event this weekend and Ben's going to be doing a reading from one of his children's stories. And um, he is, you know, we we learned to be kind of fearless in our transparency. We use discretion. Obviously we, we don't expose the children to things we think they're not mature enough to understand, but, but he's very much connected to this book and he wants other kids to get better. He's really passionate about that. And that's why, you know, in the movie, he, in the little trailer we did, he actually says, you know, I hope other families will do this. You know, oh, yeah. I, I want other kids to get better, and uh, it's very moving. And my and daughter they, they as well. Can, people can see the um, the movie on YouTube. It's a nine minute long movie. When I first clicked on it, I thought, I think I've got the wrong movie because it didn't start off with you talking. <laughs> about it. And I thought, this is the wrong link. <laughs> and yeah, it was you, and then I was yes. really thrilled to see Ben because I've never met him before, and his yeah. sister. Yeah. talking and saying, you know, yeah, this has been hard. You know, it's like, I told you, mom, you know, we got to do something about this. I, I'm getting ignored here. Yeah. There's so a legion of children with autism, but there's also a legion of siblings and they need a lot of attention too, I think. Yep, absolutely. Well, Susan, thank you so much for everything, for the for staying the course and, and being where you are today and now being ready to help so many other people. Uh, the book Unlocked Everybody is um, available now. You can get it from Kindle or purchase it from Amazon. And um, it's Susan Levin, it's called Unlocked, A Family Emerging from the Shadows of Autism. And if you're going to be going to Autism One in the third weekend of May, we'll both be there and we'll be happy to talk to you and answer more questions. So um, Susan, thank you very much. And I'd like to also, thank everybody listening today. Uh, if you're new to Body Ecology, please subscribe to Body Ecology Living with Donna Gates. And also feel free to leave comments on the Facebook page. See you next time and have a great day.